Good evening, everyone. I'm Hema Subramaniam. On behalf of the Sophia College Department of Life Sciences, I welcome you all to this webinar. Celebration of Women in Science, Rosalind Franklin, the woman behind the discovery of the DNA structure. This is to commemorate her birth centenary, which is today, the 25th of July. We are particularly happy to celebrate her, not only for her profound, though quiet contribution to the field of genetics, often understated or unsung, as well as in the field of virology, in the structure of the tobacco mosaic virus, which is lesser known, but also the fact that she was a woman scientist in a field largely dominated by men. One wonders how much and whether things have changed since those times. In addition, the fact that such a brilliant X-ray crystallographer passed away days before the Nobel Prize was awarded to her contemporaries in the field, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins, makes it all the more relevant to remember and celebrate her. On this occasion, we are indeed glad to have with us Dr. Vinita Bal from ISA Pune as our speaker. Thanks, Dr. Vinita, um, for having accepted this invitation. I now hand this over to Ms. Michelle Pereira, our postgraduate student, to introduce Dr. Bal. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Vinita Bal. Dr. Vinita Bal is a trained physician who has worked as an immunology researcher throughout her working life. She completed her MBBS from BJ Medical College, Pune, in 1979, and her MD from University of Bombay in the year 1982. At present, Dr. Bal is affiliated with ISA Pune as a visiting professor. She teaches basic as well as advanced immunology to BSMS as well as PhD students. Dr. Bal has worked as a staff scientist at the National Institute of Immunology, New Delhi from the year 1990 to 2016. From 1982 to 1990, she worked as a postdoctoral scientist at Hafkin Institute, Mumbai, and the University of London, UK. She has published more than 95 original research papers and more than 30 reviews and other articles in English. In addition, she has also written on a variety of subjects for lay people in Marathi. Dr. Vinita Bal has worked on diverse areas in immunological research, which includes understanding immune responses in viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, Japanese encephalitis, and typhoid as infectious diseases. Also trying to understand how vaccines work, how immunology how immunological memory can be manipulated and how allergic immune responses can be modified by focusing on T-cells. She has been a guide to about 20 students for their PhD and a teacher for immunology to many. Outside of professional life, Dr. Bal has been interested in various issues like feminism, science and society, peace movement, and so on. She has and is still associated with various NGOs for the same. Status of women in science has been her keen area of interest and work for the past 20 years. Dr. Vinita Bal was also a member of the task force on women in science from the year 2004 to 2008, which was set up by the government of India. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Vinita Bal. Thank we are very you. pleased to have you amongst us today. Also, before proceeding, I would just like to uh, address the audience. In case you all have any uh, any questions or queries during the session, you all can put them in the chat box, in the YouTube chat box. It will be handled at the end of the session, which is after the talk. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Bal. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, so let's let's start. Uh, 
as i as is obvious today is the 100th birth anniversary of uh, rosalind franklin and that's the reason why we are here celebrating her work and also celebrating women in science the celebration is necessary as you will realize later on not sharing let me just see if i can this is okay let me okay all right so uh, this this slide is telling you the importance of rosalind franklin she was an english chemist and an x-ray crystallographer her work was central to the understanding of molecular structure of dna and of course rna along in addition to viruses coal and graphite and i'm assuming most of you who have joined live on the youtube are students of science so i don't need to explain what dna or rna are those are of course the real genetic material uh, on which we inherit everything that we have so uh, franklin's work is also on coal and viruses and these were appreciated in her lifetime so she did get some acknowledgement for that and unfortunately her contribution uh, to the discovery of the structure of dna was largely recognized after her death so uh, Brent, brenda maddox is one of her biographers and this is what i'm quoting from her article in nature in january 2003 she titles it as the double helix and the wronged heroine and the reason why she calls it calls her a wronged heroine is what i'm quoting below in in late february 1953 rosalind franklin a 33 year old physical chemist working in the biophysics unit of king's college in london wrote a, in her notebooks that the structure of dna had two chains she had already worked out that the molecule had its phosphate groups on the outside and that dna existed in two forms two weeks later this is looking like a very sh sharp competition now uh, two weeks later james watson and francis crick at the cavendish laboratory at C cambridge built their now celebrated model of dna as a double helix they did did it not only through brilliant intuition and a meeting of compatible minds but also on the basis of and this is important franklin's unpublished experimental evidence which had reached them through irregular routes she did not know that they had seen either her x-ray photograph showing unmistakable evidence of a helical structure or her precise measurements of the unit uh, of the unit cell of the dna crystal and what was the image the image that you see on the screen this is the famous photo 51 and it gets quoted absolutely everywhere whenever people are talking about franklin uh because this is what was the basis on which we know that she actually was very very close to uh finding the dna structure herself so regular substances so what is crystallography in a sense so uh, regular substances like crystals diffract x rays when x rays are thrown onto the crystals and this pattern of dispersal of the uh, rays based on how the crystal uh, interferes in the passage of the x ray x rays is how uh, is what is recorded as crystallograph and this particular one shows that an exceptionally clear differential pat diffraction pattern in the center and that is the crystallized dna molecule this is the uh, this is the helix what you see around it these uh, areas around it are the ones which are periodicity of the repeats what nobody knew just by looking at the uh, this photograph was that whether this periodicity or the helical structure was of for two helices three helices or four helices but at the same time this is something that she had in her hand so uh this is this is what we know today so where she began as the x-ray diffraction picture which gave us the idea and this is something that what you see on the screen is obvious to everybody who has been doing biology even in the school so uh, what you see on the left is various the double helix with the connections in between and then on the right hand side you see these a t g and c as four bases these are the purine and pyrimidine bases and 
the yellow balls that you hopefully can see which are on the periphery of this structure are the phosphorus items and this is what she had deciphered already uh, based on that crystal structure so this is so obviously she knew what she was looking at and uh, unfortunately what what happened later on is described here so in 1962 james watson from francis crick and morris wilkins received the nobel prize for the discovery of the structure of the dna franklin had passed away by then from ovarian cancer she really lived she had a very short life however what was missing from the ceremony was not just rosalind franklin but also the acknowledgement of her work which had contributed enormously in those years nobel prize stipulation stated that in no case may a prize amount be divided between more than three persons so if uh, rosalind franklin was more deserving her name should have been included but this is where the discrimination probably set in she was denied credit conveniently based on that and the question that some of us would like to ask and continue to ask is that was this sidelining because she was a woman this became more apparent the the uh, injustice done to her became more apparent when watson later on wrote in his book very very frankly rosie of course did not directly give us her data for that matter no one at king's college which is where rosalind franklin was working at that time realized that the data were in our hands this admission appeared in watson's best selling much acclaimed book of the discovery called the double helix it was published in 1968 so he himself acknowledged that there was something which which now we we think should not be done and it should not have been done at that time and even to in today's day we say this should not be done so let's take off from where rosalind franklin was and to see how common or uncommon these kinds of sidelining are of course rosalind franklin was very close to nobel uh, prize i'm not necessarily saying that every woman who works in science can achieve nobel prize but there are very 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 few women even in the nobel prize list and here is what i i want to give you as what was happening in cambridge and what was happening in india we are we were no different on the left hand side is is a quote or is is a statement Uh, based on franklin's employment and uh, earning a research fellowship in 1941 franklin joined university of cambridge this is before she joined kings uh, in london to do her research so physical chemistry laboratory under ronald george rayford norish who disappointed franklin for his lack of enthusiasm so she was feeling sidelined even at that time fortunately she could leave cambridge and come to king uh, king's college and where she did this outstanding work afterward she moved to burbeck college and other places around the same time a little earlier in the 1930s when kamla bhagwat uh, later on she married and her surname became sohoni kamla sohoni is a very well known name in women in science uh, she was a graduate from bombay university which is obviously relevant most of you are probably uh, graduates from bombay university she sought admission to the indian institute of science in bangalore this was in 1930s its then director nobel Ra Na, laureate c v raman turned her down and this may sound shocking but she managed to put pressure from various corners and ultimately very reluctantly she managed to do her masters under c v raman but c v raman was no not to not just say no to her but even other women scientists because he thought women's presence in the laboratories distracts men and i i am actually not quoting his words very uh, specifically but all i'm saying is this is this is what he said and it has been mentioned in the history of science so if this was the beginning of women's career careers in science where are we today because obviously we can't be simply living in the past and in the history so let's begin since all of us many of us are also looking at how we get uh, older how we acquire knowledge how and of course how do we acquire 
biases and prejudices along with the knowledge. So I'm talking about acquiring gender biases. So this is, this is uh, something that many of you, since you are so much younger than me, would probably remember that if you are looking at gender, science, gender in science textbooks, which means how many illustrations in this case actually predict, uh, actually show women, contribution of women in whichever form. So in this, there is 52% men and boys, 28% neutral objects, 14% mixed and 6% girl children. If you haven't looked at this, I, I would suggest that you go back and look at your present or whoever, if you have a younger sibling, look at that person's or younger sibling's textbook. So what are the roles that men are shown to be playing? They are as engineers, lawyers, professors, pilots, mechanics, etc. Women as cooks, nurses, or else simply standing along looking as onlookers. So gender stereotyping is happening to us without us knowing or without us acknowledging from the very early school days. How are women perceived? They are perceived as passive, dutiful, and confined to home. Men are supposed to be outgoing, adventurous, aggressive, with scientific bend in mind. So if a girl wants to become a, somebody who is looking for adventure sports or even uh, with a, for a science pursuit, you can imagine that her upbringing as well as her family's upbringing may not necessarily be encouraging her to do that. This is another one uh, that, uh, which was quoted in 2009. Based on the earlier uh, pages that I showed, uh, NCRT, which, which actually makes the textbooks for schools for, for our country, they took notice of this to an extent and said that, okay, let's, let's simply improve few things. So when they made books in 2006, 7, 8, this is old data, but 6, 7, 7, 8, Chunawala and others from TI for the Homi Bhabha Center uh, actually did this analysis. And what did she find? These were the textbooks from grades 3 to 10. So it was an extensive uh, evaluation which was done. Still, significantly less female figures. These figures are also not active, but were more often passive observers. Females as mother, nurse, teacher, etc., and in non-remunerative occupations limited to domestic space. It's I I have I'm not saying that uh, do, functioning as a nurse or functioning as teacher is something that is very very inferior. But we what we should be talking about is the stereotype which is how women get pushed to certain uh, professions and men get also men also get pushed to certain other professions so both are forced into fitting into a pattern which is something that we need to change so men are in variety of activities which were economic in nature professions like women scientists and doctors were not depicted Will a schoolgirl dream to be a scientist or a boy, an elementary school teacher? So these are the two professions which are going out of stereotype for the particular gender that we are talking about. Surprisingly, even the grade eight new and grade seven textbooks which talk about giving girls their chance present these examples of the unfairness. So now let's move to the next section. How frequently does one find women academics and uh, women? Uh, how, uh, how frequently do, do we find women academics and women researchers uh, in general? And that's the question that we'll, we will ask in the next slide. Hopefully, I can get there. Okay, this is this is the data which was uh, not mine, but it was data uh, uh, collected by a very enthusiastic master student called uh, Akanksha Swaroop. And her teacher was Tuli Day. And both of them are from SPPU, which is the Savitri Bai Phule Pune University. Uh, uh, Akanksha had come and met me and uh, talked about what can she do. So she was vaguely look, uh, looking at proportions of women faculty in different institutions in the country. And uh, in, this was done in 2018. And this 
our uh, preprint has been, been published in BioArchives in October 2019. And I'm going to show you some data based on that. So this is that what you see on the top here are the absolute numbers and these are the proportions. The red bars, which represent with female faculty, women faculty are tiny bars. They vary between 10 to 20 percent or even less. In Patna, for example, this could be 3 percent in Patna IIT. And this is the tallest bar, which could be about 20 percent in Palakkad IIT. So regardless of how, how many women uh, enter PhD for PhD, become uh, complete their degrees, finally, when it's a job that they are trying to get, this is the proportion which is really, really pathetic. So the, I'll show you a few slides of this kind from the same source. This is this is a proportion of in ISERs. Since I work in ISER Pune, I thought the way I want to show you guys Bombay IIT, I also want to show uh, Pune ISER because both are e more or less equally bad. But Bombay IIT was established many, many years ago. Pune uh, ISER Pune is only 15 odd years old. Even there, what you see is the proportion is about 20, 22%. This is pr practically the best because even Pune, Aysar Pune is one of the oldest and you see that it has 111 faculty members. Aysar Kalkata has 103. Aysar Bhopal, Mohali are the older ones. And some of these Barampur and Tirupati are new ones. But at the same time, you see that from 3%, 4%, 5%, the well-established ISERs haven't moved much beyond 10, 15, 20%. And of course, the population of women is 50%. And that is why we keep saying that there is some amount of discrimination possibly happening, which is why women don't manage to, um, do not make it to the faculty position. And we'll look at that in, uh, in the next few slides. So this is, this is a global pattern. I have been talking about India, but I simply wanted to show you from Akanksha's data that in 2018, when she looked at some of the extremely reputed places worldwide. So this is Oxford and Cambridge in the UK. This is Caltech, Stanford, MIT, Harvard, Harvard Princeton, all in United States. Uh, Imperial College is again London, University of Chicago, and ETH Zurich. If you look at it, this looks like the best bar in Oxford, which is close to 25-27%. And in, in uh, countries, developed countries, where, uh, which are represented in this slide, these efforts to encourage women's participation in science has been continuing, a push has been continuing. All of you must have recently heard about Black Lives Matter. If we were to plot uh, the frequency of how many black uh, faculty members are there, probably the situation is likely to be worse. But even that doesn't necessarily mean that women should not be encouraged. But what I'm trying to say is there are underprivileged sections of the society which need to be specifically encouraged to get into a position, especially when they are deserving. And this deserving is a bit that people, many people cont uh, contest about and question about, but I'll, I'll talk about it a little later if possible. So, uh, sorry. so this is the next slide. So what I had shown earlier about IITs and ISERs was the well-established faculty members which means that uh, people finish their PhDs, they finish their postdocs, and then after they are looking for a permanent faculty job, such as assistant professor or uh, associate professor and uh, something along those lines. So th those are the permanent faculty positions where women were in this very, very small proportion. What I'm showing you here now, this is a Ramalinga Swami fellow, forget about uh, the, some mistakes which are there in the uh, nomenclature, but the leftmost is Ramalinga Swami fellow. This is a re-entry fellowship, meaning you might have heard that many people, many scientists, or especially PhDs, those who obtain PhDs in India, 
do go outside for postdocs and when they are thinking that yes i have spent enough time during during a uh, doing a postdoc and now i do want to return so if the faculty positions are not available they tend to use ramalinga swami fellowship as an entry point and even here at this point the number of women proportion of women is really really small close to 20% inspire faculty is a slightly different one in the sense that those of us who finish their phd's but for one reason or another do not or cannot go outside the country but are uh, showing a lot of promise for uh, doing research they are normally employed or given a five year fellowship as inspire faculty so or in ugc faculty or so what you see is essentially a major uh, difference between the men and the women here too so the point that i wanted to highlight with this uh, slide is that even earlier on before you start competing for the faculty position and further promotions this is a picture that you see and uh, so if women are working if despite this and i know sophia is a women's college and the uh, uh, staff members the professors i i was introduced to are all women what i don't know is whether there are even male teachers in the in, in the college but regardless of that it's a women's college so what happens to these women who are bright who are enthusiastic who are who have come with aspirations to learn and possibly uh, make a career of their own and for this career of course you need to put in a lot of effort but ultimately if you manage to do uh, manage to be, uh, find a job and become a working woman what is it that you do mind you i know in sofia and, and in many other women's uh, in many other colleges not just in mumbai university but in many other universities um, especially in the area of biology we see many more uh, women um, women teachers as compared to those uh, data which i showed you so as it is there is a preference for many women who are absolutely well qualified to enter into teaching profession and i'll make a reference to this when i talk uh, talk about this a little later so those who who manage to uh, get into the field of academic research what happens to them do they uh, think they have a rodi and these are some of the data which are uh, which have come out of a survey which was uh, carried out by anita kurup and others anita is from neas in bangalore and there were a few others involved so she actually along with her team interviewed women who uh, had finished their phd's they were either continuing in research or they could not find a job and hence they were out of research and uh when they, this was this is a uh, picture this is a graph which is showing pie chart which is showing that how many hours per week the women uh, put in in research in normally the way i had worked in science research immunology research in nii i used to tell my students that you do need to put in at least 40 hours a week and theoretically you should be putting in even longer because i put in 40 hours and you are at the level where you need to put in more hours because you have to learn a lot more than what i have to do but 40 hours is normally taken as sort of a cut off point as if you are above 40 you are putting in a lot of time and below 40 is not a lot of time so what we see is women with family responsibilities are still putting it more than 50% of the women are still putting in more than 40 hours so we are looking at this section of the uh, of the pie chart which is more than 50% so obviously trained women uh, tend to put a significant uh, number proportion of them tend to put in as many uh, office uh, as many working hours as their men colleagues do but what happens further so uh, this is this is where i was talking uh, i was referring to the teachers so women even when they are have their phd even when they have their postdoc experience they tend to look for a job or get a job which will provide defined working hours and i i will simply say that they are expected to 
uh, co- cook or supervise or it, and then feed children feed uh, senior citizens if they are at home meaning in laws or whoever and then get out of the house and then they should not be staying away indefinitely there should be a time for them to come home so that the rest of the family will get a good hot meal i know it may sound very crude but that is what is expected of a woman and that is why finding a fixed hour job is what that very well qualified women also tend to do because in research it is much more flexible and normally a lot more demanding so that you may have to go at 8 o'clock some day you may have to stay until 8 pm on some other day and these were these are unpredictable hours so what you see as these two big chunks are the ones where women graduates or phd's are in research and training in universities or colleges or in academic institutions so they are essentially i'm sorry as did i say training i meant teaching research and teaching in universities and colleges or in academic institutions so their teaching uh, uh, becomes sort of forced on them because of the circumstances so many of these women have break in career and why do they end up having a break in career and this is this is the response of women in research who who have wir stands for women in research who have provided uh, uh, numbers and what you see is that care for ch- uh, children and elderly which is 40 no close to 48% is the quote and quote culprit for which forces them into a break in career there are also other jo- other reasons but this is the largest chunk that you see and mind you in this survey there were also men in uh, research and men who uh, quit science research and did some other jobs were also interviewed and these this uh, propor- proportions that i'm highlighting are very specific to women and not seen in in men so uh, so family commitments is a single major factor for women dropping out of the chosen career and this is the big chunk of 53% which women claim that they had to drop out of science uh, and this is based on those who managed to stay in science so they also face this difficulty they somehow manage it but many women once they are out on a pregnancy leave half the time they cannot find a job which suits their their qualification when they are ready to come back so what may help so there are some issues which are there which uh, which will be useful to discuss and i wouldn't necessarily go into this except to highlight that there is child care there is flexibility of timing and there might be other you know, f- facilities which might help and this flexibility in timing in, is again 31% and the child care facilities they get highlighted because many many institutions do not have uh, convenient chi- and uh, child care facilities which are of a certain standard so this is something and i'll i'll refer to this again when i come uh, go to the next section and uh, this is sort of you know uh, talking about uh, career progress and is the career progress smooth or hurdles affect men and women differently since we are in the covid-19 pandemic situation and i know most of us are really fed up with covid-19 or are phenomenally afraid of covid-19 getting to us and then us falling sick somebody falling uh, even sicker and may need a ventilator and so on and so forth but i i am associated with a group in pune uh, called nari samata manch this is a women's group and during this pro- uh, the lockdown period the, there was a survey conducted so this was an online survey conducted by nari samata manch during the lockdown period in in the month of may and the, this was primarily intended to see how uh, what is the impact of lockdown on both men and women because as you must be experiencing because we still are out of lockdown but not quite out and about as we used to be and what we are experiencing is sort of a new normal so what uh, if if men and women everyone in the family is forced into one household for 24 hours 7 days and we spent many of us spent 5 weeks 6 weeks 7 weeks into a complete serious lockdown 
so so those many days together and obviously there will be uh, flash points there will be problems there will be various issues but this is this is what the survey wanted to look at and i will only show you a few slides which are related to this this survey so there were about 500 and uh, not about there were 572 women and 324 men who participated in this online survey and this is their age group distribution so maximum respondents in both men and women were from the 31 to 40 age group and this is this is the group which is actually uh, working very seriously the, this is the group where men and women are married and are probably having young children they are struggling they are probably trying to look if they are if they can afford it they are looking for a better place to stay they have uh, major loans to repay all of this is is so so called quote unquote normal situation as the normal lifestyle that we are sort of familiar with so in this survey we asked whether the effect of lockdown was good bad mixed or there was no response and again if you see 40 around 45% of the women said that the effect of lockdown was good and the reasons for good i will illustrate in in a minute but not just women but men also said effect of lockdown was really good and about 58% of the men said so more more at a higher frequency than women said that effect of the lockdown was really really good so and the bad is is really minority so you should remember that this is in may so we were in lockdown from say 20th of march and this survey was at least 6 7 weeks after that so it was around 12th 13th may to say 2025th may so we were looking at being in the lockdown for two months and these were the days of complete lockdown in wherever these women and men were we don't know where their locations are because in that sense it was an anonymous survey but it is interesting to note that many more men thought as a proportion many more men thought that the effects of lockdown were good and what were these good effects so the survey was meant primarily for uh, either married couples uh, so the husbands and wives or live in partners so both were clubbed together because live in partners were not not in significantly high numbers but essentially they are a couple staying together so that's how we looked at it so 63% of the men said that they realized how much work women do in the house on a regular basis and this they thought was a positive impact of the lockdown they had never realized how much work the woman does 35% of the men also acknowledged that household help which is normally or the domestic help which is normally rendered by maid servants contributes to easing of significant workload from working women and both these points i want to make a minor comment on this is the second point especially many of you must have heard that immediately after the lockdown most people paid their uh, domestic help the salary of month of march because most of the uh, people who were helping them uh, the labor laborers they were uh, had spent at least 3 uh, weeks 3 weeks out of 4 working by the end of april we had heard that there were problems maid servants were not getting paid because the uh, house owners were saying that you didn't come and work so why we should we pay you and I, if i am doing your work why should i pay you this was an argument it was not a fault of domestic help that they could not come we couldn't go to work either so it the lockdown was a lockdown the out, the problem of that it was that whether it was cooks in the house or other kinds of domestic help all of the, those went away in the sense they were uh, they were staying in their houses and we were staying in our houses so despite this complaints which i had heard about um rich people or at least middle class people not wanting to pay to their maid servants in april and may and so on because they did not work was some counterbalanced by this figure that at least 35% of the men acknowledged that household help is actually critical because that provides some relief 
to their wives or the partners. They also realized how much work the uh, women do because these are working women. Most most of the women that uh, we we uh, that participated in the survey were working women. So if woman is working, man is working. Despite that, how much of a how much work the woman keeps on doing? So this was these two were very very significant acknowledgments of something that is wrong in what we considered our normal life before the lockdown. Forty seven percent of men interestingly also claimed that they could pursue their hobbies during the lockdown because otherwise they get pushed. to the back burner because there is so much of pressure to work which is something that all of us tend to do so this is the critical point now will husbands or partners continue to help the woman of the house once the lockdown is over and interestingly 55% of the men said they will definitely continue to help women at home however women were pessimistic i think they know it better only 22% women thought their partners will continue to help why did i present these data reason why i am presenting these data is because this what this these uh, this survey was not about women in science women teachers women academia we don't know what they what uh, jobs they were doing but this represents women that their work is hidden nobody notices it and because of that it takes toll on their career and even man in the house normally does not do it when man is also forced to sit at home he realizes that you know chopping vegetables buying something uh, setting up pressure cooker or making some uh, chai and coffee also or repeated snacks if one wants to eat sitting at home all of this the woman is doing and they do need to think about how much time she spends into this so this is sort of coming to the end man and woman man woman equality exists in our constitution and women will have to continue their struggle to achieve it and i have tried to show you with two three different aspects but this is this is where i want to end by showing the same photograph but with a quote This is the quote from Rosalind Franklin in a letter to her father in summer of 1940 when she was 20 years old. Science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. This is something that even in the pandemic area we do need to uh, keep in mind because because of the fake news because of irrational claims that are made we keep distancing science Uh, or pushing the science behind and go with all sorts of remedies all sorts of uh, uh, means to prevent infection and so on without realizing that we are being irrational she also says science for me gives a partial explanation of life this partial explanation is absolutely correct because science while what i say today is the truth as i understand today it is not going to remain the truth necessarily say 15 years down the road because we are in science we are discovering and we will change what is what was earlier as a hypothesis or a proof with new proofs and new data so it's a partial explanation of what life is or what the knowledge is in so far as it goes it is based on fact experience and experiment so even at the age of 20 and i'm assuming many of you who are on the youtube you are students are more in that age group at that age in that age or when she was just 20 while she was writing uh, to her father rosalind franklin had a very clear rational thinking she she came from a rich jew family but uh, it, uh, and with she her family was very religious but at some point she says i am culturally a jew but i don't think i am really a religious person so the science i suppose and the pursuit of science actually helped her in coming out of many things including bringing in rationality in, in her thinking so it's very sad to see that somebody who was so capable was simply denied an opportunity to get nobel prize not just because of her death that was one thing she died early but because 
she was possibly a woman, the three men ganged up. I know I'm using harsh words, words but three men ganged up to ignore her claim and put forth a hypothesis which has revolutionized our lives, but at the cost of not acknowledging Rosalind Franklin for what she was. Thank you very much. I think so we can start with the question. Yes, ma'am. The question answer. Yeah, sure. Uh, the first question we have is from Dr. Madhuri Kaji, who asks how to end gender discrimination in wages, and do you think gender discrimination is easy to fight? First was was wages, you said? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Wages. Yeah. Okay. Wages is is relatively simple, and I will answer that because this is a top down approach. The government, as I said, it's in, in terms of our constitution, we are equal. And you must have heard that in most places, especially the kind of jobs that we were talking about, women in academia, women in teaching, there is a very clear diktat which says women, uh, the men and women should not be discriminated based uh, on their gender as far as their salaries go or wages go. But there, men and women who do hard work as in labor, even today, we find that laborers who are working on construction sites or something or the other, different jobs are given, uh, well, they are again uh, viewed in different ways, but different jobs have different wages associated with it. And women are supposed to be doing jobs which go with lower wages. So if I'm doing the same job as the man is doing, and if I'm getting less money, that is criminal. So that is something that we, we have to remember and the, the constitution does not permit this kind of discrimination. The second point is about how will we achieve it. The, it is, uh, as I said, the, if it's a question of salary or wages or something or the other, the top down approach helps. Even if I'm feeling that, you know, uh, I don't really think this woman deserves, the law will do the arm twisting and I will have to pay what is required by the law. So that, in a sense, is relatively easy to achieve. What is not easy to achieve is change in the attitude. Most of us, that's why I started the, this conversation or this talk with how we are brought up in a gender biased way from our textbooks, from our households, and all of you who are there as women and mothers also would re remember and possibly would uh, remember even doing a little bit of discriminatory attitude to boys and girls or uh, brother and sister if they are in the same house, that the sister is supposed to look after uh, the younger kids, she's supposed to look uh, help mother in kitchen and so on, while the young boy can sit in front of the TV because huh, he has different interests. We do not necessarily think about it, but these are the attitudes which make up our personality. And hence, those of you who are young women and or who are tomorrow's mothers need to remember that your kids do need to go through gender unbiased upbringing. It is not so easy, but we have to look at it from a very long perspective. Okay, ma'am. On that question only, I have a question. Mm -hmm. If you want to raise a number of women scientists, mm -hmm. what step would we take as a parent and as a society as well? Okay, so first is if, if you are thinking of a scientist, the rationality is, is a key point. In the sense, uh, if I say this, it doesn't normally go down well, but uh, even in Corona times, uh, everybody is saying when COVID-19 is happening around that, Okay, you come back and uh, pray to the God for, for so that you don't get your um, COVID-19 infection. So a faith of this kind, which does not have base, this is also something which is counterintuitive or contrary to the rational practices which science prescribes. So in a sense, our culture is also contributing. So if we want to inculcate the rationality in young kids, 
we do need to tell them that what is rational what is scientific answering questions to the best possible extent about when kids ask question and provide them a rational answer so uh, for example if you have a snake bite you do not call uh, a somebody who uh, who is sort of you know a, a guru to get rid of the snake bite related poison but you seek a doctor's help so this kind of difference is not seen so much in the urban india but it is still seen in some parts of urban india as well as rural india so these kinds of attitudes need to be built in or to talked about from the very beginning in addition as a society as I, as i said probably we also need to change our textbooks once again to say that women are also capable of doing something and you must have heard that women are very very commonly uh, doing job of nursing but they are called sisters and there are also brothers and in india in in uh, nursing environment there are hardly any brothers so as a society also we look at this as women's responsibility saying oh women are good about it there is nothing good or bad about it if a man wants to serve somebody or help somebody he can also do it we simply do not take it seriously so reason why i was earlier saying was men some men who love cooking if they want to become chefs they are you know in demand but if a man wants to just look at uh, kitchen uh, look after kitchen in the house he is ridiculed not necessarily in the house but by the family these are the attitudes that we need to uh, notice and stop harassing people for taking on something that is unusual so men taking on what we consider is traditional women's job and uh, women taking on traditional men's job women have been taking on traditional men's job because they have been uh, doing jobs for years on end at least for 50 70 years but men doing uh, looking after kitchen is still a rarity that is why we talk about it as a rarity so that's where I and mean, one has to begin at home ma'am yeah. the next question we have is uh, do men tend to not believe or disregard the data on gender bias in science and if so why okay so i don't know how many of you have uh, experienced this but sometimes the first hand experience actually counts and i give my own example in this context that uh, i went to a marathi medium school in pune and it was a poor uh, public trust run school in the school in the class i was in i never found any discrimination between men and women what i did not notice at that time was there was discrimination between classes and caste in my class there was practically nobody who belonged to what we these days call more commonly as scst scheduled caste scheduled tribe so nobody from my class noticed that there was any discrimination once i went to medical college i realized that in the class of 200 on in the first on the first day there were about 60 to 65 students who came from the reserved category and everybody keeps saying oh those are the ones who are such nuts they come because of, that they don't have merit meritorious students do this that and the other but we we were clubbed together in alphabetical order so in the in my group of 20 there were two muslims and about 6 6 7 8 possibly uh, boys and girls from the scheduled class so in a, in a group of 20 there were so called 10 of the open category two muslims and 7 8 scheduled caste out of these 20 all uh, uh, as many open merit students passed third mbbs in the first attempt as the reserved category so they were not less meritorious they were hard working they were equally good they may not have uh, ease of speaking in english and so on but normally we tend to uh, 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 disregard such examples the entry into medical college actually made me aware that there are these so called scheduled caste people who also are seeking the um, 
seeking uh, admission and want to pursue medicine. When I spent time in London for about four years, that is when I realized racial discrimination coming my way. And I, I can assure you that after that, when I started doing my job in Delhi, the gender-based discrimination came my way left, right, and center. So all of this, in a sense, is realization that discrimination is happening. If I am, that's why I took the example of Black Lives Matter also, but if I am a white-skinned American man in America, it is very, very unlikely that I will notice that there are uh, this, uh, there are discriminatory practices continuing, and even what we perceive, what we think of as ordinary remarks, are not uh, can be perceived as discriminatory and insulting remarks because of the situation that that underprivileged person is in. So that is why I keep thinking that if you are sensitive person, if you are reading about very many other things which are discriminatory then at some point, even if I belong to the privileged status, I should be able to, uh, to appreciate that I am privileged, but I know and I need to be aware of and do something for the underprivileged. And this underprivileged category, I'm sure some of you from here also uh, would, would be belonging to that. It also includes LGBTIQ community. Those people are also discriminated against and harassed. So many, many ways in which discrimination is there just under the surface. If, you, if, you, if we decide to look under the surface, we discover it. If we decide that we don't want to look at it, I am very happy as I am, then I will never discover it. Next question is, how can a government help to encourage girls to take a science team? Okay, I should tell you this, that in India, Surprisingly, uh, there are very many women who do join the science stream. So at the entry point, so after 12, you know very well in the 12th, the uh, toppers are more uh, young girls than young boys. This, this everybody talks about every year. So it's not that women or are, are girls are incapable of scoring well. But again, uh, sur surprisingly, if you're looking at entry to the 12th, I mean, after 12th, or even at 12th, 11th class science stream, or after 12th science stream, women and men are pretty much 50%, 50%. So at that point, we don't really need to encourage women specifically. Reason why I'm saying this is that it's uh, in some other countries, including some countries in Europe and United States, this proportion is more in favor of men. So very relatively speaking, few women enter the science stream. The major drop, and I didn't show you these data because there wasn't enough time for that, but major drop is not even up to PhD level. Okay, those, so of course, those who want to do BSMS, there will be larger numbers. Not everybody who has finished BSMS would want to pursue PhD. But if you look at especially biology, and because I'm familiar with biology, I'm, I'm talking more about biology, that in biology, at the level of entrance to PhD, there are practically at least 40% women, if not a little higher than that. So there is a minor drop in proportion but not significant. In physics uh, and mathematics, the, uh, the numbers of men entering is much more than women. And this again is possibly about, uh, because of the upbringing that women are told that, oh, you, you are duds, you will not understand physics or mathematics, don't go. Biology is a soft science, you can go there. This is also inculcated, this is also told to us. But even if we take to, to look at that dud science of biology, uh, in uh, after PhD, when women get married, then women get pregnant, then there is also the issue of looking after kids. At that time, the major drop uh, drop off happens. So that is why I said Ramalinga Swami entry fellowship, re-entry fellowship, only twenty percent women and eighty percent men. You also have to remember that normally men uh, in a, in husband wife pair. 
husband is say 3 4 years older this is this is sort of custom why do we have to have it is another matter but so man would the husband would finish his phd earlier than the uh, uh, wife so man would find his first postdoc outside first and the wife will have to follow him to the same city in the united states so that even if it's a secondary not so interesting postdoc she will accept it when he finishes his 5 years of postdoc and he is looking for for a job back home uh, he he uh, because and also because he is the man we accept that he has to be earning so he will look for a job if he gets it then the woman either has to uh, leave her postdoc halfway or stay back come back but she again is restricted because her husband is has is located say in mumbai she cannot find a job even in pune forget about in any other city and during in this phase only she is becoming pregnant and she does she does even if it is artificial insemination we know that the semen is required and man has a role in uh, making a woman pregnant but it is treated as if it is all women's job she has to be responsible and so on and so forth so these are the issues which are in uh, which uh, in, uh, result in major drop in the proportion so it is like a pyramid even uh, up to class 12 or bsc msc or phd the pyramid is not uh, tapering up but as you go up if you look at ramalinga swami if you look at assistant professors if you look at senior professors if you look at the head of the departments in research atmosphere i'm talking about you see major major differences in the proportion of men and women and that is the social construct rather than what 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 is actually necessary so it can be reversed the next question we have ma'am is if the number of women scientists are facing professional discrimination it must be having its repercussions on academic publishing as well so what sort of repercussions do they have surprisingly and this is my old data uh, which i did not show you because it is really really old but when i started working on women in science i had done a survey this was probably 2002 or something i can't remember that i had published a paper where i looked at indian women in biology because i know uh, may, i knew many of uh, women in biology and not in physics and chemistry but i looked at their publication and what we normally look at as major data set is the pubmed data set so i looked at the pubmed and all the publications which are coming from the indian uh, subcontinent Uh, which were uh, recorded in the pubmed as data and looked at how, what is the contribution of women and what is the proportion contribution of men and what i realized was that on an average uh, the productivity of women was not bad it was marginally less it was women were not women were not publishing in what we call euphemistically high impact journals as much as men were uh, publishing but they are capable of publishing was becoming very very evident from what what i was uh, what i had collected as data but these data i mean somebody has to collect data and normally as you know um, we are very poor in collecting national level data of any kind in this country and covid 19 is also another example we don't know how many exact cases of tuberculosis we have we do not know how many exact cases of cancer do we have in the country similarly we do not know exactly even in academia how many women and how many men are publishing and what are they publishing all of these data actually need to be collated because they are useful in setting up and modifying policy policies which will uh, help in in this particular context bringing the women on par with men so when when i told you that women uh, even married women who are working in research do spend more than 40 hours at least 50% of them spend more than 40 hours a week working that shows and they do publish but it's also some of the traits which actually were very clear in rosalind franklin's uh, memoirs memoirs in the sense uh, biography that she wanted 
more confirmation of the data before she could publish her and claim that she has solved the so-called double helix structure. So women tend to be a little more diffident and wanting more support and uh, confidence before they will go out and say something. Men are brought up to be in such a fashion that they feel confident and they go out and publish. So those differences between men and women broadly, I, I'm not saying this at an individual level, but generally women as a group and men as a group does appear. So men do publish more often smaller papers. Women tend to pub collect more data and will publish uh, fewer papers, but papers are normally of reasonable quality. Next question is, has a DST woman scientist grant help unemployed woman scientists? Is there any data available? Data, you have to ask DST. This is something that I have also tried to look at uh, repeatedly, or I shouldn't say repeatedly, but I did try it uh, in early years when I started looking at it. Data are not so easily available. One of the demands that we had made, made I was introduced uh, in my introduction. It was said that I was a member of the task force for uh, appointed by the government of India to look at the status of women in science. At that time, we had made a recommendation that these kinds of data that you are asking for should be put up on the website by every institution, every college, every uh, working place. And there should be yearly data available so that we know whether there is progress or after employing five women in one year, nobody employed another woman for 10 years, and then suddenly the ratios completely were skewed. All of this can happen. And this was, this was a recommendation that we had made. So if you are looking for DST, WAS A and WAS B, or whatever those schemes are called, there is also a some, uh, somewhat similar scheme, but with better funding from DBT, which is called BioCare. All of these are such small schemes in the sense the number of women who benefit from it is really, really tiny. It's really like a drop in the ocean. So we do need many more of these schemes. And unfortunately, uh, what has happened is original plan was if women can actually take advantage of these schemes and start publishing, then they should be considered for the faculty position. Uh, and that did not happen. So unfortunately, many women would uh, avail three years or six years of DBT fellowship after their postdoc, their uh, husbands are working, they remain as super postdocs and still do not manage to find a job. So at some point, um, they get thrown out of the system. This has been continuing. And despite wanting to do various things, you know how the wheels turn. They, if they turn, they turn very slowly. So despite having some schemes, schemes, there isn't as much of an impact as, as one would like to, but certainly I don't personally have the details. Biocare details might be available on the DBT website and theoretically uh, WAS A, WAS B should be available on DST website, but I don't know, I haven't ch checked. Before the next question, if I can make a little comment, uh, we are very proud to say that in our department, we have a WAS A and a WAS B scientist. Oh, wow. Good. <laughs> Great. Okay, ma'am. The next question is, are the number of women scientists significantly lesser in India than abroad? And is there any such data? Um, if you are looking at relative numbers, uh, what I showed you uh, on one slide, uh, data prepared, data collected by uh, Akanksha uh, uh, is is giving you the global picture. I think in Turkey, if I'm not mistaken, for whatever reason, women scientists are in very high proportion, meaning they are more than 50% in some places in 70%. But why that exception, I do not know because I haven't really met Turkish women to figure this out. But otherwise, 10 to 20% is is looks like ceiling for women scientists anywhere in the world. So uh, there, there are again, no data that are available periodically. So now what has happened is this task force that I was talking about, it worked from say 2003 to 2008 or thereabouts. And we had recommended that everybody, every institution put up uh, gender-based uh, data on their website, including that assistant professor, how many men, women, uh, 
senior level, how many is men, women, and so on. So uh, the the paper I showed you uh, uh, from the Pune University, that young girl actually systematically went through all the data of all I I T S, all I C E R S, and uh, so on to get this information, and she collected data. The data I showed you is only part of it. She has more data in that figure in that uh, paper. So there are 2018 data available. But somebody like her needs to do it, which is shame on us. Why can't we have a single site where such data will be available? This is essentially a census work, right? That in if we we are counted as one man, one woman, three men, seven women, and whatever it is, all the data of this kind should also be uh, available. Unfortunately, we don't have. We don't believe as a society. We don't believe in collecting. baseline data for anything and i know i'm harping on this point again but it seems to be the case all all across disciplines and all across different questions next question is would equalizing maternity and paternity leaves help in reducing the discrimination bias of employers in picking men over women this is an interesting question and i uh, will tell you about it and i'm sure many of you might have experienced so earlier meaning say until 5 7 years ago there was only 3 month maternity leave available for a woman and she could avail it depending on when she was pregnant meaning we are talking about 30 40 years uh, depending on when she became pregnant either her own three pregnancies or two pregnancies or one pregnancy she would get a full 3 month benefit for it because this depended on the uh, family planning policies of the government so uh, at that time also it was pretty well known that if uh, say in our kind of setup a post doc interview is taking place and uh, women and men are appearing for interview people, um, most men who were sitting in the committee would ask so are you married uh, no sir so are you planning to get married mm, maybe Uh, so then then you will get pregnant and then what what will happen to your work this was very insulting as if getting married the the man who was asking is not married most men are married so why are they asking questions so this is this is something that that keeps happening and uh, we we have tried to suggest various ways in which such uh, obnoxious questioning could could be curtailed but it does not happen so what are the consequences of three month maternity leave away for young woman in her uh, late 20s appears for interview it is assumed that uh, instead of uh, employ giving her an employment we should give it to a man because man is not going to become pregnant this is the disadvantage of three month leave there is also further added disadvantage what was thought of as an advantage turned out to be a disadvantage the maternity leave has been made from uh, increased from 3 months to 6 months now and there is another kind of leave which is called as family leave and this family leave can be availed by both men and women so if both husband and wife are uh, in the government service for example between them they can avail the 6 month leave uh, for various excuse me so sorry for various purposes for example many women take leave when their kids are appearing for 10th exam or 12th exam or when in laws are not well and they need to be looked after so in a sense this is family leave which can be used for the these 6 months you can use any which way over a period of many years so that your responsibilities are taken care of theoretically both men and women are eligible for this leave but in practice what we see because women are supposed to be taking care of the family only women employees take advantage of this leave when they take advantage of this leave this is another reason why men sitting on uh, in the senior position or position of power keep saying you know these women they go on leave every now and then and then there is a work backlog who's going to do it let's not employ women same logic is happening even with 6 month maternity leave my god 6 months i understand that if you have a 3 three, 3 year project and if a woman goes on 6 months leave there the, there will be a setback to the project 
but shouldn't the government or whoever are the funding agencies provide for employing somebody else for six months or making some alternative arrangements if they are possible so all of these are questions that do need to be addressed but short term effect and this is what i mean that these diktats or these modifications in the leave policy were made uh, top, from top they had a top down approach and they have backfired on women because men's attitudes have not changed and they tend to think it's better not to employ women let them finish their pregnancy and everything and maybe then we will think of employing so women in at the in the age group of 40 is not employable because by then all her skills which are required as a scientist as a postdoc are completely outdated science moves very fast so if she takes 4 5 6 years of break essentially she is thrown out of it completely so that also is a problem so it it backfires on women taking leave in multiple ways so many women uh, tend to think that even if i'm working suboptimally i will not take leave which also affects her in the long run because of her you know maybe ill health overwork and stuff of that kind Uh, thank you, ma'am. That's all the questions we have mm -hmm. for today. I will now hand it over to uh, uh, Krishna Indu Nayar for the final thank you note. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bal, for the enlightening talk. We are immensely grateful to you for making time for us from your busy schedule. The theme for today was women in science, and we thank you, ma'am, for shedding light on it so beautifully. Coming from a college that empowers women, this means a lot to us. Today's talk simply explained that knowledge knows no gender. With respect to elucidating the structure of DNA, getting an XRD of a compound is extremely difficult since crystallizing biomolecules like DNA, which have fluidity in their structure, is extremely difficult. Rosalind Franklin definitely and rightfully deserved to win the Nobel Prize with Watson and Crick. However, in another instance, it was Perry Curie who argued for Marie Curie with the Nobel Prize Committee. that the contribution was made by her and that she deserved the nobel prize the scientific community has been biased against the contributions of women in the past but this gives us hope as women scientists that times and situations are changing positively we hope to move towards a future where women are given equal opportunities and credit for their work and contribution towards science and development i would also like to thank dr bal for the interactive question and answer session I'm sure all our participants have learned a lot from this engaging seminar. Thank you once again, ma'am. I would also much. like to thank our college and our principal, Sister Ananda, for giving us this opportunity. Today's webinar was supported by DBT Star Scheme, which we are very grateful for. And lastly, thank you, dear participants, for being so interactive and patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you, you young generation, would push this issue further. Definitely, ma'am. Shall we do?